Welcome back to the mead making classroom series sort of thing I'm running. We're in mead making 501. So we've been through 101, 201, 301, 401, covering a slew of topics. Through all of that, we've landed here with our deepest topics yet. In my current finale, I might go to 601 in the future if I find some new topics. But we've got a bunch of great topics to help you be a better mead maker, to be a competitive mead maker, to wow your friends with awesome mead. So let's dive deeper. Here are our current topics today. Topic number one is balancing a brew and making it amazing. So there's a whole uh, big deep dive on when things we need to talk about there. Topic two is sourcing fruit and when to use it and how to use it best because you want to get the most bang for your buck. Topic three are the very not so kind to us fusels in mead and the off flavors we might get and how you can avoid them or how you can recognize them when you run into them. Topic number four is water chemistry and mead making and why that's important too, something we don't always consider. And topic five is clearing a mead. How do you make it clear beyond just letting it set for a hot minute and why clarity might matter. You'll notice I'm holding some notes right here. These are free to you if you're a visual person. Check out the link in the description, download them, print them out, do whatever you need, but feel free to use these notes, read along. Uh, I'm gonna be referencing them slightly as we go through. So let's dive into topic number one, which is balancing a brew between sweetness, acidity, and tannin. So I have spent a fair amount of time in the competitive mead making sphere. I've also had the uh, very cool thing of talking to a lot of great mead makers in the world. And one of the biggest things that most people talk about when making good mead is balance. And the, the balance comes between three things or four things, depending on how you view it. Lots of people will say sweetness. E easily enough, sweetness is just how sweet something is. Acidity, that sort of bite, acid bite, something like, you know, think of lemon juice or uh, acidic fruit like that. That's acid. Tannin, which is the kind of mouth coating feel that you get with drinking normally a wine or a mead or something, how it coats your mouth, how it washes down. Is it watery? Is it like a red wine where it draws all the moisture out of your mouth? That's the sort of tannin. And the fourth leg that some people talk about is alcohol and the content. Alcohol does play a role in this whole balancing agent. Um, I'm not going to dive deep into that, but in short, you want to balance alcohol, which has some uh, challenges, some sweetness and stuff like that to all of those things. You can make a very balanced brew with acid, sweetness, and tannin, but if it's too high ABV, it it's not that it's impossible to fix, it just takes more time. So that's my shorthand on that. So we've talked about it, sweetness, how sweet is it? Generally speaking, when we make mead, we back sweeten with honey. and. You could use whatever you want, but honey is my preferred back sweetening agent unless I'm trying to do something that is not honey centric. But all mead should be honey centric. Acidity, this can be uh, found in a lot of different methods. If you use fruit that's highly acidic, you're gonna naturally have a higher acid level with the brew. So let's say you made a lemon mead, that's gonna be highly acidic. You're gonna to have to play a little bit of a game to balance said lemon mead to not be too tart or acidic. And tannin, that wa washing mouthfeel sort of thing. How do we achieve balance between these three things? Let's, let's throw out some uh, hypotheticals. Let's say we made a lemon mead and it's pretty tart because it's a lot of lemon and it, it's not super, uh, high in tannin or the body isn't very big. One way you can temper down that high acidity is to add a little bit of sweetness because sweetness and acidity will kind of naturally balance themselves like that. And then the tannin will also support those other elements. And so the whole, if you imagine like three bars right here, if this is acidity and this is tannin and this is sweetness, once you raise these two up, this comes down. And so they all level out and then it's balanced. Same thing goes for sweetness. If it's too sweet, 
add a little bit of acidity and tannin, and then it will level out, and so on and so forth. Tannin, blah, blah, blah. How do you adjust them? Acidity is easy because, generally speaking, you just add more acid. It could come in the form of lemon juice. It could come in the form of uh, lime juice. Those are kind of natural acids you find. You can also buy specific acids. Citric acid, malic acid, uh, tartaric acid, lactic acid. These are all different kinds of acids you can purchase and use them in conjunction. For acidity, what I like to do is I like to take a little sample of my brew, like this, and I'll get a couple more glasses. If I know it needs acid balance, I will pour them out. I will then sprinkle a little bit of each individual acid. Citric acid, which is mostly found in limes, lemons, those bright citrusy fruits, I'll sprinkle some of that in there into one of the containers. Malic acid, I'll sprinkle some into it. That's in apples, pears. Uh, there's a whole list of fruits that are malic acid based. That's the kind of profile you're gonna get. Tartaric is generally your grapes and your dark fruits like that. Sprinkle some in there, taste them. Go back and forth and say, oh, the citric did this, that was really nice. The tartaric and the malic weren't quite what I needed. Or I love the tartaric and the citric and the malic were too bright. You can kind of sample and do some balancing that way. So that's what I like to do. Highly encourage you try it. Sweetness, simple enough. Add more honey. Uh, make sure you followed all the rules to stabilize and pasteurize so you don't have any issues with that. But more honey, more sweetness. E easy enough. Tannin's a little more different and difficult because you can use oak to help add some tannin, some body, some flavor to a brew. You can also use powdered wine tannin, which is helpful. It doesn't work as well, or it takes longer when you throw it in later on in the brew, because it does take some time to form and bond with the actual brew. So don't just throw in a teaspoon of tannin and then come back the next day and go, man, this hasn't worked all that well. Yeah, it needs some time. It probably needs a couple weeks. But oak, powdered wine tannin, Stuff like that really helps to build up the tannin or the body. Balancing all three of those things will make an amazing mead, I promise. It's been a challenge for me to learn it, but I promise if you learn it, you're going to not only wow your friends more, but if you decide to ever be competitive, it will definitely help you be more competitive in that the mead making sphere. All right, topic number two, which is sourcing your fruit and knowing when to use it. Okay, so we make a lot of mead. You're probably making a lot of mead. Traditional meads, of course, get good honey, do all that. Let's say you wanna make fruited meads. Where do you get fruit? There are a plethora of ways to get a hold of fruit, and you can find stuff that's not local to you in other forms and fashions. For example, I'm in Oklahoma. Uh, let's say a gooseberry, a very weird fruit, is nowhere near me. There is a chance that I could get gooseberry if I go to a grocery store and I look in the frozen section, or maybe, miraculously, they have some in the, the fresh section. If not, and I'm still looking for gooseberries, then I have to go through a couple different other routes. So if the frozen section doesn't work, if the fresh section isn't good for you, go ahead and look into online sources. Sometimes you can find purees. Purees are a great way to get fruit flavor, interesting fruit flavor, um, while also really not spending that much money. They're not necessarily cheap, but you can also get more interesting things. Flavorings, concentrates, if you can find a concentrate of it somewhere, there's, that's also a thing you can do. And last is flavorings, which I don't really recommend the flavorings. We're not gonna dive into that, but you can. Essentially, you choose your fruit, I really wanna make a pineapple mead. All right, well, I have, I'm in the season of pineapple, great. Go to the local grocery store, see if you can find it. Find it in your frozen food section. Whatever you do, try to find a good source of it if you can local to you and then outsource it to other things. There are some cool companies, like I mentioned with the purees, uh, Oregon Fruit Puree and Boyron are both two that do a lot of different purees. So. Don't shy away from those, they work really well. I have a video on using puree and mead. I made a peach mead that was to die for, so stinking easy, um, and you use pure, puree, so that's pretty good. Now, when do you use these? We've found our fruit, how do I know when to use them? 
Generally speaking, people will suggest you do them in a couple different manners. You can either take and put your fruit in the beginning of fermentation when everything's most vigorous. We call this the primary fermentation. This is a great place to get a lot of true, air quote, true fruit flavor, meaning that you're getting this real fruit essence, as I'm gonna call it. You're gonna lose some sugary content from said fruit because the yeast will consume the sugar that's in there, but you will still get this more true flavor that sometimes pairs well with adding the tannin and adding, um, of course, the flavor to it. The yeast, if you've paired your yeast to the fruit, will consume those sugars and help to push out some of those flavors and you'll have this conjunction and this beautiful melding of things. But essentially, the primary, more essence of the fruit. Sometimes more color will also come from said fruit. So if you're trying to get a really beautiful blueberry mead, maybe put it in the primary instead of the secondary, which the secondary is after fermentation has ended, ended or slowed down, you can add the fruit then. This will get less fermentation on the fruit itself, thus retaining more of the aromatics and the flavor of it. You'll still have a little fermentation unless you stabilize or pasteurize before you do this. You're still gonna get a little fermentation, but you'll lose less of the fruit character. Now, you didn't have all the fun playing that the yeast had in the primary. They'll do a little bit in that secondary state. This also works really well. I highly recommend to try that. The optimal way to do this with fruit is honestly in the primary and secondary to split your fruit out if you can, um, or to do like two thirds in primary, one third in, in secondary. But as somebody who makes a lot of mead, that's a lot to think about. So if you wanna just pick one, pick either direction. But essentially primary is more essence, more fermentation on the fruit, but they'll play with the yeast a little better. Secondary is maybe a little more aromatics preserved, a little more sugar preserved from said fruit, and just in general, maybe a, a different, more sweet character, I don't know. This is all still personal opinion on which one you like more. I'm not gonna declare that one is better than the other, but I will say that I find myself putting stuff in primary more than secondary at this point. Topic number three, fusels in mead. All right, now this topic is a bit of a rabbit hole and uh, you might refer to the notes for a lot of this because I'll talk about some of them, but there's some more in-depth notes on each fusel. What is a fusel? A fusel is an off alcohol or a byproduct alcohol, byproduct alcohol that is produced when yeast are stressed, generally speaking, and or just in the fermentation process. Sometimes these products are just a part of the fermentation and they eventually leave. Sometimes the yeast are stressed and they will lose their mind a little bit and put off these fusels, as we call them, or off flavored alcohols. And there's a whole list of them. Some fusels are just gonna go away over time. So that's the nice thing about this is you might run into one and go, man, I get this little off character. There's a good chance it will leave the brew over time. Some of them do not. Now I know some of you are looking at me like, tell me which ones are the ones that will leave the brew. Uh, I, I don't have that information for you and I apologize. But here's some information about some of them. First one is acetaldehyde. It is the precursor of ethanol. It's naturally in for the fermentation process. It's generally not an issue unless you too heavily oxygenate a finished brew. So at the higher levels, acetaldehyde will often put off an oxidized apple or acetic cider sort of aroma or taste. Ethyl acetate is our next one. This is also another one produced. This is an ester produced in fermentation. And we I didn't mention this, but an ester is an organic aroma compound formed by the reaction of the acid and alcohol during fermentation. Some of these esters are used by the yeast in their cells for basic processes and others are put out into the brew. So not all esters are bad, that's not a bad term. But ethyl acetate is a simple ester that's produced by the yeast in fermentation. It's one that commonly, it's a very common one, as we see, at low levels, it will impart a fruity flavor to the brew that is desirable. Some studies suggest that up to 60 milligrams per liter created a desirable product. 
one thing is this whole ethyl acetate can increase over time, that amount. So at a higher perceptible level of ethyl acetate, it will have a nail polish remover, aroma, and taste, which is not what you want, obviously. Here's another one, 3-methylbutanol. This one occurs in poor fermentation conditions that are not right for the yeast or the dissolved gases in the brew are not optimal. It has a very banana oil, balsamic, and hot alcohol flavor component to it. I'm going to start butchering these. Phenolithanol? I think that's right. This is produced by certain yeast and have a rose and can have a rose-like character to it. Because of this, it's often used in many areas and products around the world to produce said rose character. I found that to be interesting. 3-methylpropanol, another fusel that is produced in a less than optimal fermentation condition for your yeast. It, at low levels, it provides more of an alcohol presence to the brew. At high levels, this, this will produce a cooked cabbage aroma and taste. Also gross, I don't know about you, but I don't want cabbage mead. That's a stressed one, by the way, if you didn't pick that up. Methylbutanol, also known as active amyl alcohol. This flavor often provides a boozy nose to your brew. This can help to produce a sweeter nose. At high levels, it'll be a very boozy aroma and possibly a slight roasted onion. And the final one that I have notes on at least is 2-methylpropanol. At regular levels, this will provide a warming flavor or character to your brew. At high levels, it will provide a green aroma or character. I can't give you every single specific on why these are produced. And I know some of you are like, tell me how to avoid it. I need to know how to avoid this thing. In truth, it's just clean fermentation that comes from the right temperature, temperature range, the right nutrients for your brew. Those two little things in conjunction generally will keep your yeast happy and healthy, and you'll avoid the bad ones that you don't want. Some of these are not bad, and that's one interesting fact here is, uh, I think it was ethyl acetate. It says, like, at 60 milliliters per, 60 milligrams per liter, it created a desirable product. Obviously, that's a, that's a part of fermentation. That's going to happen. You don't want things to be too high. All right, we're moving on to topic number four, which is water chemistry in mead. So this is a topic I am still diving into a little bit. It's a pretty deep rabbit hole because I, for a long time, used my just my standard water from my house, which is not bad. I've had very good results with my water for mead making. Where I started to run into issues with my water chemistry was when I made beer. And I started to notice my tap water was not cutting it. For some reason, it just was not working as well. So then that made me dive down this rabbit hole. Your tap water can be very awesome. You can make some great mead with it. As long as you don't have any issues with uh, quality. You know, if you taste it and it's super high chlorine or has some weird profile to it, then you want to watch out for that, generally speaking. And you can actually get a water profile for your brew or for your water by contacting your city, by taking a water sample. I think Home Depot has a little water sample kit and they you ship it off and they send it back to you and they tell you what's in your water. That's a great way to know what's going on. There's a whole, like I think I still have it somewhere, um, a, a water chemistry profile from my old house. That's a little bit old. But it has a ton of information on it. Some of the levels, I, I, it's hard to read, honestly, unless you're in that field. So. It looks a little bit scary. There's a lot of stuff added to our tap water to make it safe for us. That means though that sometimes it doesn't always do as well when you're brewing with it. So that's just something to consider. So if you don't want to use tap water, go and find some spring water. Go and find some other water source and use that. You can use RO water, which is um, reverse osmosis water. It's a system you can uh, get in your house or you can go buy it at a, a store and it strips every bit of those characters, all the, the chlorines and chloramines and stuff like that that you don't want in your brew um, or that you want lower levels of in your brew and your nutrients and things. So you have to add things back to it essentially. So let's say that you have figured out your water and what it needs. Here are some things you can add to your water to help it taste better and be better for brewing. Potassium metabisulfite or Camden tablets are often used and, and beer and lots of different things, especially for water that has high chlorine or chloramine, like those kind of things, it helps to 
off gas those out of the brew. So what people do is they often will, for like mead, they'll put their water in a bucket, they'll throw a, uh, a camden tablet or potassium metabisulfite amount in there and they let it set for 24 hours and it generally will off gas all of that. Or if you're brewing beer, people just put it in with the mash in the beginning when the water's heating up and that will also help to get rid of that. Those things don't taste great. You don't need to do it with every batch, but it's helpful. Calcium chloride increases calcium and chloride. Also lowers the pH or the mash pH. Epsom salt adds those two things. It adds magnesium sulfite, or fate, excuse me. And you want to get food grade when you do this. So Epsom salt will help avoid the high calcium level. And that alone can help avoid premature yeast flocculation and potentially a problematic ferment. So that's helpful there. Non-iodinized table salt increases sodium. Make sure and use non-iodinized. So I don't know, I've never really thrown salt into a brew. Baking soda increases the alkalinity and the mash pH. So that's an increaser of pH, not a decreaser. And lactic or phosphoric acid are two different acids you can use as well that decrease the mash pH. So I took a lot of this information from this link that's in the notes. So thank you to the brew cabin for helping me with that. We talked about RO water. Essentially, if you get it, you need to know what to add. The cool thing about beer and most of these websites that I've used to brew my beer is they tell you a water profile, which is helpful because I don't know what I'm doing sometimes to throw things in. So they, you know, you're making this sort of New England IPA. It tells you what kind of water profile you're using. So it says RO water and throw in all this stuff. We don't really have that for mead. And maybe one day, if I get real confident, I'll figure out how to do it. But for now, I'll tell you this. I would use tap water to the best of your ability unless you have a lot of knowledge about RO water or adding things to your water that it needs. Or if you have yourself one of those uh, basically overviews of what your water is missing or has too much of. Our final topic is all about clearing mead and the importance of a clear brew. So a wise old man once told me, we drink with our eyes, and I think that's absolutely true. Generally speaking, you're going to judge a brew first thing by its clarity. Now, unless you're brewing something that is supposed to be a hazy, uh, hoppy mead, generally speaking, you want to have clearer stuff. That's just because perception. We want to bring people into the mead making world, and it's already a weird place because people don't know what it is. They get kind of anxious about trying new things sometimes. If you hand somebody a very cloudy brew that looks sketchy, they're going to formulate an opinion already. And that's just a hard thing to sell people to keep drinking mead if they already have a negative thing. So start with a clear brew. Now I say that as I'm holding a not super clear blackberry hopped mead, but my saving grace here is this is a hopped mead that's supposed to be a little hazy. And you can tell people that, hey, this is a blackberry hopped mead. It's a little hazy. That's how it's supposed to be. Or, hey, this is my no water pineapple mead. And look, it's super clear. That's what we want, we want with that. There are lots of ways to clear a mead, including time, which is literally just letting it set for an eternity until you want to cry. And eventually, things will fall to the bottom. It does take a lot of time for things to clear. Or sometimes, depending on the things that are happening in the brew, it could be fast. So it just depends. There's another method that's kind of like time, and that is cold crashing. So cold crashing is all about taking your container of mead, putting it into a cold chamber, and letting it set. A lot of the particulates and the big solids will fall to the bottom, thus helping you clear the brew. It's kind of helpful, and sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. We do have some force clearing methods. There's quite a few around. So one is Isinglass. Isinglass is uh, something used commonly in beer. It's a net negative charge, which I'll explain that in a moment, and protein. So it's a net negative charge, which essentially means that when you add it to the brew, it goes to the positives that are in said brew and it binds to them and it pulls them to the bottom. If you have things that are negative in the brew floating around that are net negative charge, they'll stay floating around this whole time, but the positives will not. And so positives bind, fall to the bottom. 
You can get Isinglass in a powder form or a liquid form. Either way, you have to turn it into a liquid before introducing it. And here are the rates, ratios at which you need to use it. Um, it's a, it's really not a lot. I have used it before and I'll talk about that in a second. Sparkaloid, one of my favorites. Sparkaloid is this from the earth powder kind of clay thing that has a positive charge. So binds to the, the negatives in the brew. And it works really well with like all the brews that I've been doing stuff. So essentially all you do is you take your sparkaloid powder, you put it into some water, you boil that for a little bit, and then you add that to the brew. You wait about two or three days. And generally everything I put sparkaloid in has gone super clear. So that's what I like about it. You can also buy it in bulk if you can get a hold of it. Next up is Polyclair 10, which I have not had as much experience with or success with, but essentially it's a beer stabilizer that says it's supposed to help to clear and filter brews. Uh, I've found this online, but I haven't been as sold on it. I just wanted to mention it here because it is real. I just don't use it a lot. Next up is gelatin. You can get this, I think you can get it in the baking aisle even. You don't necessarily have to buy it brewer's grade. So gelatin also binds in the brew to our positive negatives and helps to bring things to the bottom. According to the Midwest supplies, in order to use this, using more than the recommended amount will remove too much color and flavor compounds from the wine and some body. So that's something to watch out for when using gelatin. You add one quarter teaspoon per gallon in a small amount of cold water and let that sit in the, in, then boil it. Then you add the boiled water. According to Wikipedia, it says it only takes one ounce of gelatin to clear 1,000 gallons of wine, which is pretty bonkers if that's true. Next up, we have bentonite. Bentonite is another uh, earthly found thing. It is a clay granule that is used in wine for clarifying. It possesses a negative electrostatic charge, which binds to the positives. You can often put this in your brew before fermentation starts, or you could put it in later, but lots of people have success putting it in early, like in the beginning. It doesn't hurt your brew in fermentation, but it will help it clear up uh, after fermentation is done. You use one to three grams per gallon of wine and mead. You wanna use it with some water, stir it in, and then put it into your brew. Next up is Kisosol and Kaidosan, or Chitosan as I've called it in the past. Um, these are, this is a two-step one. You add the Kisasol first into the brew. In that one, Kisasol, Kisasol is negatively charged, so it binds to the positives. And then you add, about an hour later, Kaidosan, which is the positive side. So between those two, they get all the positive, negative things that are proteins that are floating around that you don't want, and they pull it to the bottom works really easy in about 24 hours. It is shellfish based. So if you use this, just know that if you are allergic to shellfish, you're not gonna wanna use them. And also if you use them, make sure that you are not giving them to somebody who's allergic to said things. You need 8.3 milligrams of kydosan per gallon and 2.5 milliliters of uh, kisasol per gallon. I have a whole video on testing all of these and I've had great success with some of them, and, but not with every one of them, like the Polyclair 10. Clear mead is just important for the fact that we want to continue to invite people into this space and make them comfortable. And sometimes you can sketch people out when you don't give them something that it looks presentable or what they want. So is it the end of the world? No. If you're only drinking your mead and you're the only person doing it, uh, drink the cloudiest brew you want. But I would avoid drinking brew that has yeast or extra sediment or chunkies or something in it because that sounds kind of gross. So that's been all of our topics for today. We have cleared quite a few things and we're very, very deep in this mead making sphere. And I hope you've learned lots of stuff through 101 to 501 at this point. If you haven't been through 101, uh, please go back and check out 101 and 201 and 301, so on and so forth. Check out the notes if you'd like. I do have a composite note from 101 through 501. It's like a 40 page document, but you could put it in a binder and uh, go back to it whenever you want. If you'd like other mead resources for learning, I have a bunch of stuff on my website, including a mead flow chart, which I highly recommend you get as well. That helps you know how to make what mead and gives you the steps and processes. And it's free for PDF or JPEG download 
or you can buy a physical one and I can send it out to you and do that. But lots of resources on how to make mead. I highly suggest you keep looking on the internet, find what you can, find some recipes and make more mead. Let me know what you think and you've thought about 501 and maybe, just maybe, if you have topics for 601, go ahead and drop them down in the comments as well and there could be a chance that I make 601 in the future. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Go make some mead. Cheers.